Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible, both from Milligan College, as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for the day. Now, here is Dr. Magnus. Good morning. Welcome to In the Word, a Bible study ministry sponsored by First Christian Church in Johnson City, Tennessee. We're so glad that you're with us this morning for our, our Bible study from the Gospel of Matthew. And um, this week, it's, um, it's myself and uh, Dave Roberts. So we're grateful uh, to be working together on this again. We've taught Bible together for, for decades and decades. So. Mm -hmm. We're glad to, to be in it together again. Uh, the next nine Sundays, we're going to be talking about God's justice and mercy. And uh, we're going to be focusing on the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Some so, powerful passages from the Gospels. Yeah, they are. And I think it's going to give us a nice focus. We're going to be in the same two Gospels for a while right. and kind of on the same general topic. So. Uh, I'm looking forward to what's coming up uh, the next few weeks. Yeah. Uh, so this Sunday, we're in Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 1, and we're going to be looking at several uh, incidents that were clustered together, kind of in the middle of Jesus' ministry, that all had to do with challenges uh, brought by the Pharisees. And these aren't just kind of theoretical, theological debates that they were having. That, Th these are life and death matters. They really are. And because um, the Pharisees are out to get Jesus. As our text today indicates, they came to a point of deciding and plotting to kill Jesus. Yeah. It was that serious. Yeah, we're a long ways away from the crucifixion, but uh, they're already out to destroy him. Yes. Yeah, and uh, it's his violation of their rules that's going to set the groundwork for that opposition. The Pharisees were a a fierce opponent of Jesus. And it's a, a fascinating study to look at the background of Pharisees, where uh -huh. they came from. And it was not just a religious party, it was a political religious party. Mm. And their history had a lot of bloodshed in the background. Mm -hmm. Well, they kind of grew out of a, of a Jewish civil war. Uh, and, yes. Uh, supported one side, and you're right, it was, it was very bloody. Um, well, well, we'll be paying a lot of attention to the Pharisees as we study through this passage and some of the others in Matthew, because Matthew is the gospel that uh, emphasizes the role of the Pharisees in opposition to Jesus. He talks about them more than all the other three gospels put together. Yeah. So uh, Matthew uh, was very aware of their, yes. their role in Jewish society mm -hmm. and religion and in Jesus' ministry. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew is also, uh, in general, the most Jewish of the Gospels. Lots and lots of quotes from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and uh, its audience, original audience, seems to have been a Jewish audience. Yeah. It, it's even laid out, some say, in <coughs> five sections comparable to the five books of the law. Right, right. There are five great teaching uh, sections there from Jesus. and. Some think uh, Matthew's trying to emphasize that Jesus is the new, no, um, new Moses. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we uh, have the Gospel of Matthew, big emphasis on all things Jewish, mm -hmm. especially the law, mm -hmm. and uh, especially the Pharisees and their teachings and their opposition to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now the, the, the immediate context for our study in uh, chapter 12 is a beautiful, beautiful teaching by Jesus right at the end of chapter 11. Yes. It's one of those cross-stitch passages, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Uh, and we've, we frequently see it um, like on a, I don't know, a bumper sticker or a refrigerator magnet yeah. or a cross-stitch uh, taken out of context. But I, uh, here we get to see it in its immediate context mm -hmm. in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, l let me read the verses I'm talking about. It's, it's chapter 11, verses 28, uh, 29, and 30. Mm -hmm. Come to me, all you that are weary 
and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yeah. Now, those are very familiar words to many of us mm -hmm. uh, who've, who've been in the church for a while. But here we get to see them right in the context of the argument over Jesus' attitude toward the law and pharisaical rules. Mm -hmm. what, what's the yoke connect, connection there? Well, they use that, that term yoke uh, to, uh, to see it as a binding, a, a holding people back. And, mm -hmm. and the Pharisees had actually built what was called a, a wall or a fence mm -hmm. around the law to make sure people did not violate the law of God. But in the process of that kind of concern, they built up such a wall or a fence that it became more significant than the law itself. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, part of their history comes from the time in exile in Babylon when there was no temple. Mm -hmm. And the people turned to the law because that's all they had of their, of their background. And the party of the Pharisees apparently had its roots, at least, in that time. But then when they came back and got the temple, it was almost a conflict between the priestly people who were at the temple mm -hmm. and the Pharisaical people who were emphasizing the law. And they built up such a system of their own laws about the mm -hmm. law that it became a yoke mm -hmm. of burdensome back, uh, uh, hold back to people to keep them away from violating anything that, that the Old Testament said. Right. So uh, Jesus seems to be aware that the, the yoke of the law, which was a phrase that they used, mm -hmm. had become a burdensome thing, something that didn't just hold them together with God and God's will, but really held them back and held them down. Yeah. And so Jesus uh, makes the contrast. I, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about a yoke, but I'm talking about my yoke. Right. And my yoke is different. So yeah. we'll be looking at some practical illustrations of how this, these two yokes uh, yeah. turned up in the life of Jesus. And, and it's interesting that the, the actual yoke that was used on animals of, mm -hmm. of uh, work or burden yeah. mm -hmm was intended to make their work better mm -hmm. and easier. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus says mm -hmm. about his yoke. Because mm -hmm. they're pulling together. They're, they're working yeah. together and it, it's an enabler, yeah. but right. not for the Pharisees. Yeah. It was a hindrance. Well, those are the words that lead into uh, chapter 12. So why don't you go ahead and read our text for us today. Okay. Chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Well, thank you. Now, we need to establish 
what it was that offended the Pharisees about the behavior of Jesus and his disciples. Because verse 2 says, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. So right. what were they doing? <laughs> well, they were harvesting grain. Yeah. They were threshing it, and they were winnowing it, blowing off the, the hulls. Uh -huh. And that was labor, which that's not condemned as such in the Mosaic Law of the Old Testament. But the Pharisees had determined what is work and what is not work, and that was verboten. It was yeah. forbidden. Turns out that they had established 39 different categories of work. And they just listed all different kinds of work that you could do. And all of that was forbidden on the Sabbath by the Pharisees, right. even though it, it wasn't, those details weren't mentioned in the law. Right. I mean, uh, work was forbidden on the Sabbath in the Ten Commandments. That's true. Mm -hmm. But they had established all these categories of work. And so um, even just plucking a few grains and, like you say, rubbing the chaff loose and then blowing the chaff off, they interpreted as a serious work. Yeah. So that was the offense. That right. the, it's, it's not that they were taking somebody else's grain. They weren't stealing, no, no, right? No. And, and that was allowed in, in the Old Testament. The, the laws were set up so that poor people could glean in the field after mm -hmm. the harvest had been done. What was left was available for the poor and the travelers. Yeah. And Jesus and the disciples were traveling. Right. But even traveling on the Sabbath, there was a limit how far you could walk by the Pharisees. Rules. There was. They had set a very strict uh, limit of the number of paces uh, right. that, that you could go. And uh, it was interesting, you know, whenever we get legalistic, people then get creative and dream up ways to get around the legalism. Uh -huh. So um, I know in, in some practices uh, in ancient Judaism, they would uh, say, okay, I can walk so far, so I'm only going to walk to that rock. And so they would walk to that rock. And then they would say, I can only walk so far on the Sabbath, I'm going to walk to that tree or, yeah. or whatever they would keep. And then they would walk as far as they yeah. wanted. So they were both legalistic and undermining of their legalism. But uh, you're right, it, it, it wasn't the eating of these grains. Uh, farmers were forbidden from harvesting the corners and edges of their field mm -hmm. and from picking up fallen scraps, gleaning. And that was there available for other people uh, to eat. And it wasn't the eating that was the right. offense. You could eat on the Sabbath. Yeah, you yeah. could eat. Uh, it was this idea of harvesting. Isn't it interesting? that the Pharisees tend to pick on the disciples of Jesus and their behavior as a way of getting at him. Right. They're, they, they're, it's like they're a little bit afraid of attacking him directly. I don't know if that's because of his obvious inherent authority or his popularity with the people or what, but uh, th this, is, this is typical you know, to attack the behavior of the disciples. But they're ready to attack him about healing. They, they bring that that's up. true. That's true. That's, that's not the disciples. It's yeah. the eating here. Yeah. Well, Jesus um, responds to their complaint when he says in verse 3, haven't you read what David did? And what we see here is an interesting pattern in Jesus' ministry of appealing to Scripture. Just as he did when he was tempted by Satan. Yeah. So Jesus, um, you know, could easily have said, he could easily, I think, have always answered on the basis of his own personal authority. Mm -hmm. But he frequently appeals to what to us is Old Testament scripture, but mm -hmm. to scripture in, um, because that's what was available to them. Yeah. And, and of course, by, uh, it's kind of an insult to the Pharisees to say, haven't you read in your own scriptures? Right. You know? They were the scholars of the yeah, scripture. Yeah, they were. And, and he picks an interesting story because it's about David, who will be the king mm -hmm. and is a kind of messianic mm -hmm. type figure, mm -hmm. uh, often compared to Jesus. Jesus is called son, son of David, David. Yeah. in the Gospel of Matthew very often. Yeah. Uh, but here's a story where David is with his companions, parallel to Jesus and his disciples. Mm -hmm. So that makes it interesting. Yeah. He'd been fleeing from Saul and went to the tabernacle. There was no temple at that mm -hmm. time. 
but was hungry and asked for food. And the priest said, well, the only food I've got is the showbread, the mm -hmm. daily bread that was placed mm -hmm. out. But he gave it to David and his companions because they were hungry. Right. So uh, that, that was holy bread, and very much uh, limited in who it was available to. Yeah. But uh, there was no limitation on it in the, in the face of human hunger. Right. And that, that's an important point there. Yeah, yeah the, you use the term showbread. That's the word that the King James Bible mm -hmm. uses yeah. for it, the table of showbread. And uh, modern translations frequently call it the table of the bread of presence. Mm -hmm. uh, there were 12 loaves of bread that sat on this table in the holy place, in the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And it seems to have symbolized God's presence in the midst of his people, Israel, 12 tribes, mm -hmm. 12 loaves. And the provision that he made for them as mm -hmm. his people. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's the context there. And thank you for pointing out the house of God that's referred to in verse 4 is the tent, the tabernacle, really? yeah. because the, the temple had not yet been built by mm -hmm. Solomon. Yeah. Um, then Jesus appeals to another uh, scriptural story uh, or, or fact uh, in verse 5. And here he, he kind of segues from the mention of priests in the tabernacle who fed David to the, the, the weekly ritual of priests. Priests on duty. Priests on yeah. duty. And, of course, priests were on duty every day. Mm -hmm. you, you, um, unlike in Christianity where we think of going to church on Sunday, uh, Jews could go to the tabernacle and later the temple on any day of the mm -hmm. week to bring sacrifices and offerings. Uh, but here, the specific reference is to the fact that they were on duty on the Sabbath day. And now he's thinking of the temple era mm -hmm. after Solomon and uh, uses a word that we probably could kind of put in quotes or put some air quotes around. They desecrate yeah, the Sabbath. Yeah, strong word. Yeah. Violating the Sabbath. But by the Pharisees' rules, mm -hmm. any kind of work on the Sabbath was totally out of line, was totally wrong. And Jesus says, well, the priests have to work every day. They're working on the Sabbath. And by your ideas, they're desecrating the Sabbath, but they're right. doing the duties they have to do. So he's, he's, by the use of this powerful negative word, he's pointing out the inconsistency, maybe we could even say the hypocrisy right. of their teaching, yeah. uh, where they would condemn innocent behavior by Jesus' disciples on the one hand, and then turn around and obviously allow it uh, to be done in the temple. It's so hard when you, when you try to get legalistic perfection in, in not doing the, most of us grew up talking about Sunday as if it were Sabbath. Sabbath is actually Saturday. Right, right. But I can remember some of the rules that were given when I was a kid. You didn't do things on. You mm -hmm. didn't go to didn't go to stores. We were not allowed to look at the funny paper in the Sunday paper until we got home from church. <laughs> it was a restriction because it was Sunday. Is that in Deuteronomy no, somewhere? I missed that. <laughs> but it was in our family. <laughs> so. and, and sometimes we can get our habits and our patterns and make laws out of them as if they're God's laws. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus is saying. Look at the priests. They're working on, you know, it's not, God's not trying to restrict life that mm -hmm. way. And um, that's a perfect example of how um, a, a desire to obey leads to a kind of legalism, which leads to a kind of hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Because, um, yeah, I remember the same thing. We couldn't go shopping on Sunday because we thought that Sabbath laws related to Sunday, even though there's no connection whatsoever. Right. Um, but let's see, we couldn't go shopping, but we could go out to eat, right? right. <laughs> so yeah. so now probably some people couldn't go out to eat yeah. either. Uh, I don't know. We, we have all these. Um, so th there's, there's the Pharisee in all of us, yeah. or there's the potential. Yeah. I still try to make Sunday a, a day of worship and, and back off from some of the things, but I don't get bent out of shape. It's just, it's not a law. Yeah. I think that, that positive approach is really, really important. Um, 
what is Sunday for? I think that's the way we should begin. Not, not what is yeah. it not for, not and that's what's what not allowed. The rest of our text gets into that, yeah. really. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Jesus is going to make some positive statements. Yeah. Well, we, we've got to uh, focus on verses um, 6 and 7 here because they're mm -hmm. so central to our passage. I tell you, Jesus says, something greater than the temple is here. Yeah. And of course, he's referring to himself. Mm -hmm. uh, the temple was the focus of the worship of God uh, for Jews. There was only one of them. So it was just very easy to say, this is where God is, is to be worshiped mm -hmm. and where we're to bring our praise and adoration and sacrifice and thanksgiving. It's all focused on the temple mm -hmm. in Judaism. And Jesus says something greater than that is now here. Yeah. And I think that's a good reminder to us that for us, it's all focused on Jesus. Mm -hmm. All of our praise and adoration and thanksgiving and is focused on him. And then he follows that up with this beautiful quotation here. If you had only known what these words mean, another appeal to the Old Testament. Yeah, from Hosea. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And the sacrifice there is mm -hmm. not, we think of sacrifice as giving up things for the Lord. He's talking about the ritual sacrifices of the temple. Okay. And, and going through the motions of ritual worship, that's important to God, but not nearly as important as a life of mercy. Yeah, yeah. Um, a handy little uh, way to think about mercy <clears throat> Uh, you know, grace is another important word that's, that we use as Christians. And uh, I've heard it put this way, grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. In other words, we don't earn salvation. It, it's the outflow of God's grace. By grace you were saved mm -hmm. through faith. Uh, mercy, on the other hand, is God not giving us what we do deserve. Yeah. Mercy is focused more on the, the forgiveness uh, of God. And um, Paul talks about God who was rich in mercy, lavished his mercy upon us. So this quotation from Hosea 6.6 6 is central to Jesus' teaching. Instead of, of pondering those words, the Pharisees were condemning the innocent his followers. And yeah. there Jesus has come back to a reference to his followers. Mm -hmm. And that's the same word that was used of the priests back mm -hmm. in verse 5, mm -hmm. that word innocent. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, verse 8 is also very important, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. We better unpack that a little bit. First of all, the Son title of, Son of Man. Son of Man is, is Jesus' preferred reference to himself. Mm -hmm. He uses that more than anything else of himself. And it's interesting that the followers in the book of Acts, for instance, didn't refer to him as son of man, mm -hmm. but he referred to himself that yeah. way. And it comes, it's used in the Old Testament a lot. Ezekiel uses it as human being. Daniel talks about son of man as Messiah, almost, mm -hmm. a, almost a super thing. Yeah. But, but it's a combination of plain, simple person, yeah. and the Son of God. Right. And with, with prophetic overtones. Mm -hmm. It's always in the prophets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's Son of Man. Now, Lord of the Sabbath um, it declares Jesus' um, superiority or um, authority over all things related to, to worship and mm -hmm. to Sabbath practice. And I think that Jesus has already established himself as the fulfillment of the whole law, mm -hmm. not just Sabbath laws, right. but the whole law. And we yeah. see that in chapter 5 of Matthew mm -hmm. itself it's in the really Sermon on the Mount yeah. where he says, uh, I've come to fulfill the law. So Jesus mm -hmm. uh, establishes his authority there in relationship to the law. Mm -hmm. Now, this event that we've been talking about in the grain fields is immediately followed up by a supporting event where Jesus is in a local synagogue, uh, a man um, with a the withered hand mm -hmm. uh, is there, and he turns the uh, uh, the table on them. They 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 set him up. 
they ask him, they really is, it, is it lawful is to heal? Is it lawful? Yeah. yeah and this time they've, they've taken um, harvesting, <laughs> which they've condemned, and now they're comparing it to healing as an act of work on the work. Sabbath. And so, uh, once again, they're defining Sabbath reverence in terms of what you can't do or mm -hmm. don't do. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus really turns the table on them in a powerful way, once again by appealing to the law. Scripture. And it, it, he appeals to Scripture, and he appeals to a specific law, this business of what happens if one of your farm animals yeah. falls into a pit. Mm -hmm. and uh, You pull it out. And the law allowed that, right? Right. It's, yeah. yeah, the law uh, allowed that. So he says then, how much more should we do this right. if it's a human being? And, and when I read that, I, I thought about Dr. Gwaltney. Oh, okay. Back in the days when I was a student in seminary preaching in a small church in southern Indiana, I brought some students down to Milligan to visit, and uh -huh. we sat in on a class with Dr. Gwaltney, Good. who had not been a professor when I was a student, but mm -hmm. I had heard of him. Mm -hmm. And I can remember in that class, he talked about the Hebraic expression of something being such and such, and then how much the more so mm -hmm. is something else. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Jesus used here, that if it's right to pull an animal out, how much the more so mm -hmm. to help a person. Right. And I thought about Dr. Gwaltney well, bringing good. that up. And well, we're all thinking about Dr. Gwaltney today, so is. I'm glad you yeah. mentioned that story. And then, in some ways, the climax of this whole teaching comes at the latter part of verse 12. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Uh, the Pharisees were defining goodness in terms of uh, what, what people did not do. What you can't And they do. were trying to define Jesus mm -hmm. that way as well. Mm -hmm. And I must admit, uh, we're off, I'm often tempted to define things that way. I know... You know, my dad jokingly used to say, what does it mean to be a Christian? I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls that do. Yeah. And, and I mean, he said that jokingly to, to point out how often we use a negative definition. Well, the press often portrays Christians nowadays as being opposed to this, mm -hmm. that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. And that negative perspective is what people pick up as yeah. far as the view of Christians. Yeah. So Jesus says, you want to know how to behave on the Sabbath day? Do good. Do good. That's right. Do good. Yeah. So anything that enhances life, that uh, feeds the hungry, that heals those, that prevents harm, that's, that's a good use yeah. of, of your Saturday, yeah. <laughs> of your Sabbath day. And so to illustrate that, he heals the man with a withered mm -hmm. hand. Yeah. It certainly didn't satisfy the Pharisees. No. They're yeah. all the more eager to plot against him. They went out to plot to kill him. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're left, folks, with some wonderful messages from our passage today. The reminder that uh, Jesus, our Lord, is Lord of the Sabbath, uh, Lord of all things having to do with our relationship with God and our worship of God. We're reminded that, that uh, greater than the temple is here. Uh, the, the Jesus becomes the, the focus of our worship of God. And we're reminded that doing good on the Sabbath and showing mercy is more important than all the rituals we can ever dream up. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we'll have another lesson from the Gospels next time and hope you can be with us then. This has been In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson with Dr. Lee Maggs, Professor Emeritus of Bible from Milligan College, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible of Milligan College. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School lesson text. This has been a production of the First Christian Church Television Ministries.